director for the IT company Atos. Um, so my job is really twofold. Firstly, is to listen. Uh, so we'll be doing a bit of listening here. Um, and the purpose of listening is to understand where the public sector, uh, in this case local government, is looking to exploit cloud technologies and how quickly you're planning to get there. And that's really important in terms of mapping our investments onto that. And I'll, I'll be covering in some fairly significant detail some of those investments that we are making. Um, and then the other side is to put the products in place. So currently we have 98 products available on the G Cloud. Uh, we'll be talking through some of those uh, as we go through, but more as examples. Um, the key purpose of my presentation today, as I say, is to learn, understand where you guys are going, what you think about cloud, um, so that we can understand how we, we map onto that moving forward. And I'm also hoping to make you more enthusiastic about cloud. So we'll be looking at how much spend uh, local, local government has on cloud um, as, as we go through the presentation. So there we go. So that's our agenda. So we're going to start out, we're going to use some cloud, we're going to have a look at cloud and G-Cloud. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about where government's going and where we think government's going. So I'll try and make it clear what are our opinions and what are government policies. Um, we'll be looking at the future of cloud. So we think the future of cloud is it's going to be free, um, which may be, which may sound a little strange. Um, but one of the reasons I asked Mike uh, Bracken the question this morning around go wholesale is um, we think there's a tremendous opportunity around this concept of multi-sided markets. Uh, so our cheapest product on G Cloud is free. Uh, it's available, no charge to the public sector, um, you can use it, and the way that we make our money is almost like the way that Amazon makes its money, is in our case it's a fuel card and we take a small amount of money from the fuel retailers as a result of people buying um, fuel from fuel retailers. The product saves about 4% on fuel costs, um, so if you're running big mobile teams, uh, worth, worth having a look at, has 29,000 uh, companies live on it. Um, and it has a few other benefits as well, but we'll get into that as we go, go through. So that's where we think the potential of public sector is going. Um, so off we go. So where are you on your journey to cloud? So what we're going to do, so if you have um, a laptop or an iPad or an iPhone, uh, you're going to need them. Uh, if you have a, a regular phone with SMS, you're going to need it now because uh, we're going to use a cloud service. Okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to run a survey. So if you've ever done, uh, or you've ever watched Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Um, and you've seen, ask the audience. Um, quite often they do, they do that, they do that sometimes at conferences, you get the handsets and off you go. Uh, this is a cloud service that's available, it's free, uh, that allows you to do ask the audience, but using uh, effectively SMS or using uh, the internet. Um, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to ask you a question. Where are you on your journey to cloud? Uh, what I'll do is I'll demonstrate it first, and then you guys can vote. Um, so if you're online, so I'm going to demonstrate it using online. Um, so if you go to the, uh, the website, twitvote.co.uk, um, and you'll see, when you get there, you'll see a quick button. So we're going to use vote now. And the way that you vote, is using a message. So it's the same as if you're using SMS. If you use SMS, when it, you, will, you will use exactly the same format of message. So the message always starts with Twit vote, so how it allocates the, the votes, then a code. So we're, for the first question, we're going to be using code, and then the answer number of the answer that you're voting for. So in this case, I vote for one. I'll put the answers back up so you can see them, and we'll do click to vote now. Okay, so I've voted successfully. And there we go. So we have one vote. So if you could have a vote now, so if you're SMSing, you SMS to that number, you can use a zero, you don't need the plus four four. Um, so 0786 200 690, and you would, if you wanted to vote, for example, as I did for no plans this year, the message would be twit vote, space cloud, space one. So three words in the message, and off we go. So yeah, so it's twit vote, space cloud, space, and then the number. So if you wanted to vote for number five, 
Uh, totally cloud, that's where um, Twitpost cloud cloud would do it. Okay, so let's see where we got. Okay, cool. So a little graph there. <coughs> Maybe this year. Okay, and the good news is, as an audience, you are typical of the public sector um, as we move forward. And I'll show you some of the other results as, as well that we've got from the previous surveys. Um, but effectively, what we're seeing is that a number of organizations are sort of having a go at cloud, but we're not really sure about it. It's a bit too new, and we have some concerns. Um, so, what we're going to do now is going to check out what those concerns are. So the way that we're going to do that um, is if you're voting online, um, so if you're using the website, we use the idea portal to do that. So we'll do su submit an idea. So this time we're going to use a different code uh, block. Um, the name to cloud is. Um, and so <coughs> using the idea portal, basically you can just type in, so you, you still need Twitvote, you still need the code which is blocked, and then you can just put any text that you want. Um, after that, you can submit as many as you want. You could, so you could, if you have three reasons why you don't think cloud is going to work, uh, you can submit three, one after the other. Um, if you're using SMS, uh, it's exactly the same. You just SMS, um, and you would do Twitvote, block, and then whatever you think the blockers are. So what is stopping people adopting cloud? What is stopping you adopting cloud? It's probably more important. <coughs> okay. So it's starting to come up there. Okay, and this is interesting. So what we're seeing here is something that's slightly different from the rest of the public sector. And I think we'll see that as we start to analyze local government's use of cloud, particularly by analyzing the use of G-Cloud, government's G-Cloud framework. Um, probably number five is kind of one of the things that we're seeing in local government. So local government's much more heavily sort of vertically application driven uh, than some central government and health. Um, that'll come out of some of the things that we are uh, seeing as we move forward. Okay. <coughs> okay, cool. So a lot around cost, uh, member skepticism, uh, you know, what is cloud, you know, public, private, hybrid, all that kind of stuff coming out. That's, that's interesting. Okay, so what we'll do um, with those uh, is, on the slides, uh, I, I use a lot of online services, as you'll see as we go through this. There are links to all of those services on the, on the slides. Um, we'll also put up uh, the results of that survey, so if, if some of the results are still coming in, um, we'll pick that up and we'll put that up as a, as a, as a specific little... Uh, results page. Um, so what does the research say around uh, the use of cloud? Um, so this is uh, an organization called the Cloud Industry Forum, uh, a very interesting organization, we're members of it. Uh, and the idea behind the, for the Cloud Industry Forum is to make cloud services more interoperable, uh, to make them easier to get onto, to make them easier to get off as well. Uh, so one of the benefits of cloud is rapid on, rapid off. Uh, it's very difficult to do that if you're, you get involved on cloud with a proprietary system that's impossible to migrate away for, or very, very difficult to migrate away from. Uh, the good news is that over the last um, year, between uh, 2011 and 2013, the public sector has accelerated, generally, its use of cloud. Um, 
So up from 38% in 2011 to 62% in 2012. Um, but it's still far from mainstream. Uh, so this was Cloud Computing 13 held up in Edinburgh. Um, and the results are pretty much the same in terms of where we, where we see. So very few organizations who are, who are either mainstream or totally cloud. Most have had a go. You know, we're starting to have a look at it. Collaboration tools are the big one. CRM systems are the, the other big one. Um, but the big bulk of infrastructure uh, is not migrating to cloud at this stage. Uh, the reasons, um, the big three are always security, um, the change, and I'll talk a little bit more about that change, um, and uh, the, the effectively uh, the business cases, the cost model, how do you justify it. So we'll cover across those. We'll also reflect back on some of the issues in, in local governments around, you know, uh, where are the big suppliers in local governments who are not necessarily kind of the traditional big supplies of IT, but in local government have a tremendous uh, presence. So we'll, we'll reflect on that a little. Um, okay, so uh, picking up uh, government's policy. So this is reflecting more on central government, but I think it's interesting to understand because it allows us to dig into really some of the detail that Mike Rackham was talking about earlier. Um, so government has a cloud-first policy. Um, and so if we try to get my mouse going, whoops, here we go. And here it is. Uh, we're going to be coming back to this website a lot. So if you're looking at cloud and G cloud, and you go in and you search on Google for, for G cloud, um, it's going to show you this, this website. Um, there's be a few adverts and then this one comes top as the, as the, the most relevant unpaid link. This is a really important website. It's like the home page of G Cloud. Uh, it has a lot of information on there uh, about how to use G Cloud, um, how to use it if you're a buyer, how to use it if you're a supplier, um, the rules, what you can expect. It is a tremendously informative site if you're thinking about adopting cloud services um, within your organization. So what does the policy say? And this slide is a mix of what public policy says uh, and what we think about it. So, the bit in terms of the mandate at the top, cloud framework OJU, is government policy. So government policy is, firstly, uh, if you're looking to commission new services, you should be looking at cloud, not necessarily G cloud, but any cloud. Um, then, if you can't buy it off cloud, you go to frameworks, and then if you can't buy it off frameworks, you can run an OJU. So that's the idea. <coughs> um, the journey is probably the other way. So most procurement professionals uh, or start out with OJU and then you kind of work back and obviously you have your local procedures for um, sub OJU um, but it generally goes the other way so uh, the way that we see it though is the, the kind of underlying philosophy behind this is one, why would you use cloud? Uh, well what you're looking for is market specified commodity products so why bother specifying something if you can just go out there and buy it off Amazon? You know, why would you do that? Or would you create a custom product if you, there are loads of products out there that already do what you do? So we see market-specified commodity products as kind of a substitute for cloud. Then there are some things that government does that it does in its own unique way. Um, and I guess within, by government here, I'm expanding that to the broader public sector. So then you've got these frameworks that government is putting in place which are really about government-specified commodity products. And it was interesting to hear the talk yesterday by uh, Wolfram Camden about how in local government there is a drive to adopt exactly that sort of thing. So the drive around uh, the applications framework uh, that Camden are looking to put in place on behalf of the, 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 the uh, government, uh, on behalf of local government in London with a view to potentially expanding that out. So specific frameworks uh, there uh, come in and then you've got OJU. And then you say, well, you know, what is that actually looking like? And so this is our view of the infrastructure that government is putting in place in those different categories. Um, so on the market specified commodity products, there are really two big frameworks there just now. There's going to be a third, so GDS have announced the commodity hosting framework. Um, the G Cloud Cloud Store, the money uh, that's on there is the maximum value of the framework. But to a large extent, it's irrelevant because a lot of these frameworks iterate so fast that you have to hope of ever hitting that, that boundary. 
So G Cloud Cloud Store and Digital <coughs> Services, what we call the Agile Framework. So G Cloud is about commodity products, and Digital Services Framework is about commodity people with a specific focus on development and Agile development. Um, government specified IDA2, um, so Identity Assurance, the current contract for that runs out next year. There's a one year extension available, um, but at some stage, Identity Assurance 2 will come out. Assisted Digital Framework, PSN2, um, so I work on one of the work streams, or have been working on one of the, the, the vendor work streams there around gateways. Education ICT, ERP support, and I think you're going to see more. So you're going to see more in that picture where government goes, look, we're just going to put these things in place um, and people can use them if you want. Um, the great thing about these is they're very open um, and quite often they're cheap. Um, so Mike earlier uh, today mentioned the digital services framework and the reverse auction that happens. So the idea is if you make it onto the framework, um, there's then a reverse auction to minimize the number of supplies in each category down to 50. Um, during that reverse auction on one of them, uh, uh, GPS had to send out a message saying, because you get to see the lowest bid uh, as an auctioneer, so we, we, we tended through that framework, and so GPS issued a message saying, please can you ignore that last bid, um, it is below the minimum wage. Um, so ignore that as representing the lowest bid uh, through the reverse auction process. Um, so in terms of kind of making these markets work, uh, a lot of skipping, you know, going back a couple of years, there's a lot of skepticism as to how the private sector would respond, will people participate? Um, and I think the, the way that uh, government ha has basically gone through this, gone through G Cloud, Digital Services Framework, IDA, Identity Assurance, it is able now to demonstrate that it can create marketplaces um, to which the private sector will respond. So, digging into some of the detail. Um, about spend analysis. The best source of data we have on G Cloud is the data the Cabinet Office produces every month. Um, so 2012, 7 million. Our forecast for this year for G Cloud is 75 million. Um, so currently this year it's on 56. Uh, the run rate is around about 8 or 9 million a, a month. Um, and we think 2014, 125 million is probably low. The potential of that framework is substantially higher. Local government, interestingly, a bit of a, bit of a uh, sort of a, an increase in activity at the beginning, but it's really slowed down. Um, again, uh, if you're online, we can have a look at this. Uh, there's an interesting website. You may see it has a. Whoops. Let's go back. Uh, let's go in here. Um, okay. Uh, GovSpend.org.uk is a website you can go, it's really available, which analyzes G Cloud spend. Uh, if I click up here on G Cloud, it'll give you a breakdown of uh, what's being spent uh, by month, by individual framework. Um, if we go and have a look at who's buying from that, um, and rank that by total, give you an idea of who's buying. Uh, if we have a look at local government, we can dig into uh, the spend for local government. So Hanslow won the award for digital. Uh, top of the list, Thurrock, Wigan, Bristol, Westminster, Islington. Um, the other thing that we can have a look at here is say, well, okay, what are people buying? So we can do show products. Um, so if we have a look at what the local government clients, uh, the local government sector buying, this is it. Digital platform, service cloud, platform for online tra transactions. Um, so what you're seeing is digital platforms, CRM implementations, um, some licensing, which is sort of borderline under the rules of, of, of G Cloud. Um, and it gives you a, kind of a good idea. In terms of uh, which suppliers uh, are being successful, so Agilis is the out and out winners um, for their digital platform, so they've, their digital platform front end, uh, Salesforce methods, uh, Salesforce and methods through uh, the, the Hanslow uh, service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> but it gives you a really good idea of uh, kind of who's buying, what they're buying, 
what's what's being seen as successful within local government? Okay. This gives you also an interesting shape. Um, so local government is the only um, sector of, of the public sector that doesn't have the same shape as everyone else. Um, so everyone else um, has sort of a, a shape where infrastructure as a service, IAS, um, is kind of higher than platform as a service, software as a service is higher than both of those put together, and the massive chunk is in SCS, Specialist Computer Services. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the way that uh, organizations have been using gCloud to hire development teams. Um, okay, so if we go to everyone, uh, show products. Uh, run that back to the There you go. Um, so Agile is without a, a shadow without the top. Um, EFT fees payments, I'm not quite sure what that is. Uh, Developer Next, Sophia Consultancy Next, Professional Services, Carers Digital Service Hosting, uh, coming in at 900,000. Um, so about 50% of the IAS and PASS spend is coming at office. Um, so that's GDS, Mike Bracken, um, and his team. Interestingly, they procure from multiple suppliers. So they don't just buy that IAS and their past services from one organization, they buy it from multiple organizations so they can figure it out as they go through. <coughs> um, so in local government, an interesting, um, the, the, the comments earlier that came through the Q&A um, is that whole reflection of the way that local government uh, parcels its services on has its services um, by in individual sort of lines of business almost, um, reflecting the fact that SaaS operations or, or SaaS services are the highest spend. Okay, so that gives us the context. Um, so now, even though I'm, I'm sure you, uh, hopefully you'll be going, well, we'll log on to GovSpend later and see what my organization's been doing. Um, this is where I move into the bit about uh, trying to promote cloud services and give you an idea of some of the flavor of the services that you can buy um, through G Cloud. Uh, one of the reasons I think why G Cloud is uh, building, but could build faster, I think is the nature of the move to cloud. Um, so within any organization, if you're looking to save money, you're going to do it based on speed and certainty. So the measures you take, uh, you, you're looking for things that are fast and you're looking for things that are certain. Uh, so one of the comments I had from uh, a senior person in local government IT who was talking about the future was saying, look, Dave, the real problem we have is we've run out of libraries to close. So closing services, very fast, very certain. Um, I'm a fan of libraries, uh, I should say, uh, in relation to that. But that's quite often, if you're looking to cut costs, what you're going to do. You know, what can we stop doing now that we are doing in the, in the private sector, it's marketing. <laughs> So you cancel the marketing budget, immediate savings uh, uh, that you can achieve. And then you go down a list of things. So you go, right, okay, well, let's let the procurement guys go at our suppliers. They're probably going to get a bit of money. And you keep going down and down and down until right at the bottom you've got transformation. And transformation is often the, the last priority in how can we save money. Um, it tends to be slower. It tends to be less certain. Um, the outcomes, you know, are... are are difficult to guarantee, um, and things change during the transformation process. Um, and I think that's why we're, we're potentially not seeing uh, cloud move more quickly. So I'll take you through my journey to cloud. As Mike mentioned earlier, um, businessland.gov.uk, I used to be the program director of that. I was program director starting in 2006. Um, 2008 was a really interesting one. Um, so the service was jointly run by Biz and HMRC, and I got a call about a week before the PBR. Um, the SRO, uh, senior civil servant in HMRC, said, "David, you know, we need to, uh, we need to see you." So I went over and said, "Right, okay, Chancellor's going to announce something next week, and um, we think every business in the country is going to log on, and the site can't fall over." Um, for us, that was an issue 
Uh, so we were running on 20 big sunboxes at the time. Uh, 50,000 users, normal daily peak, 100,000 not a problem, 200,000 we were struggling, 4.8 million we were toast. There's no way we could handle that volume. So my response uh, to Stephen, with a week to prepare um, for this peak, was it's okay, we've got it handled. And the reason why we've got it handled is because behind the service, we've implemented Akamai. And Akamai is an incredible network. About 20% of the traffic on the internet goes through the Akamai network. Because we had Akamai behind, um, we had no issues. In fact, if every person on the planet had logged in to have a look at the announcement by the Chancellor, we could have handled it. An incredible network, 46,000 servers based around the world. And um, if we want to have a look at what 20% of the internet looks like right now, and here we go. So this is the Akamai network, running 22 million hits a second, 76 million pages a minute, so over a million pages a second, uh, 4.2 million. Um, streams, uh, video streams. Um, out of those, 3.3 million currently are on-demand streams and 900,000 are live streams. To give you an example of one of those live streams, MTV. That would count as one on that. Um, the largest service we run currently through Akamai delivers about 1.2 petabits of data a day. Huge, huge infrastructure um, that's available. Um, and you might think, well, okay, you know, this massive, super, super mongus global network, you know, why is it relevant to me in public services in my local area? So these are the stats for gov.uk. Um, of a, a quarter of the visitors uh, to gov.uk come from outside of the UK. So when you're on the internet, it's not necessarily the case that you're going to be attracting, if you're offering high quality services, just from the UK. So, how much to buy into that infrastructure on G Cloud? Um, just over three thousand pounds a month. Uh, that will get you five million pages a month. Those five million pages can be served across the, the month, or all in a second. The infrastructure can handle that without even blinking. So, a tremendous amount of scalability. The thing that we see this starting to be used for is people who are launching uh, services. When we had this implemented at Business Link, at any one time I never had any idea how many um, servers my service was running on. I knew it was somewhere between 20 and 46,020, but the site automatically load balances across the two. So if we get nuked um, by a denial of service attack or something like that, it's, for us it's not really a problem. So we set, one of the large media organizations we serve, the CTO, was at a conference, you know, it's going back about a year. And I was asked the question, you know, you, you do all this media stuff, how do you deal with denial of services tax? His response was, well, our infrastructure is at such a scale that there aren't really enough hackers in the world to cause us a problem. Um, and that is the Akamai service. It is an incredible service. Um, and it's now available on G Cloud. <coughs> Mother Care. Here's a good one. This is my favorite product. Um, that we have on G Cloud. Um, so let me talk you through some of the challenges that Mother Care had. Avoidable contact, let's see if they resonate. Um, so how do we stop failure demand? People, you know, trying to find stuff online, according to Forrester, about 70% of people, if they have a problem with your organization, will go online and try and find the answer. And if they can't, they're going to get in touch with your contact center. Um, so how do you fix that? Um, handling peaks, the Mother Care peak, around about now, 10 times normal. In order to do that, you've got to train engines. How do you train fast to give consistent levels of advice? How do you manage your face-to-face -face channel? Um, so in Mother Care's case, that's stores. Uh, they have over a thousand stores. And they wanted to make sure that if people were accessing information online, or they were accessing information in store, or they were accessing information in their contact center, they were getting a good and consistent answer. And finally, insight. What are our customers telling us? about the questions, about the problems, and how can we leverage that into service improvements. Um, so the outcome by implementing a cloud product, um, which I'll talk a little bit about more, was a 40% reduction in emails and a 20% reduction in calls, a uh, two-week reduction in agent training, a consistent view of in-store help, which matched the views 
Um, beg your pardon, which match the, uh, the, the online experience with the contact centre um, and with the in-store experience. A dynamic top 10 question. So Socrates has done a lot of work saying you need to, do, you, you need to be able to pr promote your top 10 uh, questions on your website. The great thing about this product is that that is dynamic. It happens all the time. So every time someone asks a question, the top 10 questions get recalculated. Um, and finally, understanding the most frequently asked question um, of mother care, which normally I would ask you to guess, uh, in the interest of time and the fact that no one ever guesses it, I'll let you know. And um, what is the best time to conceive? From mother care's point of view, that ability to interact with their customers at the business planning stage, uh, <laughs> absolutely critical. Um, Danny Rose, so we, we do some presentations with mother care about how they, how they achieve that. Danny is a really interesting contact. Um, and one of the great things about this is the way that the internal search engine works. So uh, it comes, it's a small company who, who provide this service. Um, it comes out of uh, Cambridge University. Uh, and basically the way it works is before you ask it a question, um, it converts with the words into meaning against the knowledge base which has already done that. So you're not word matching. Um, so let's go and have a look at that in action. Okay. So let's go to gov.uk. Okay, uh, so supposing we need some help with care. Uh, there we go. So that's what you get from gov.uk if you go and ask for help with care. Guidance on NHS pharmaceutical services, probably not relevant. The welfare of your pets and dogs, not relevant. <coughs> Apply for care is allowed. She's starting to dig in. And again, this is because of the way that search, traditional search engines work based on words. Um, if we now go to uh, a mock-up of a site that we are uh, looking at, uh, which is... Okay, so this is not gov.uk, but we have taken the design principles of gov.uk, it's a demo site that we're using to demonstrate how this technology will work. <coughs> Um, if you go to govhelp.org.uk, that link won't work at the moment, um, but it will do as we roll this out. So what I'm going to do now is type in the same thing. Whoops. And one of the things that you will see is, as I go through the typing in process, every time I press a character, it reprioritizes the list of help that's coming, uh, becoming available. So as I do care, So the way that the system works is, as people are going through their questioning, it's automatically trying to figure out what is the most relevant article based on the meaning of the information that the person is typing. Um, and then you can click on uh, whichever, whichever link you want. Um, but it's not just about search engines. Um, so one of the things that you're looking to do from a contact sense point of view is to, is to basically use every opportunity of interaction in order to provide the user with the right answer. Um, so if they go, well, you know, I've used your site and I, I still can't find it, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in here um, and, you know, and type in and say, okay, I need help with uh, carers, credit, or, or whatever it is. Um, and again, in, in the contact center industry, this is called elastic search. So you're still trying to keep them online. So if they start online, you're going to make that suggestion, even when they're filling in, that I want to contact you because I couldn't find the information. They may word it in a different way that helps them find the information, but that's what you're trying to do. So, um, available on G Cloud, £3,400 a month. The target of that uh, service really um, is about taking roughly 40% out of your contact centre contacts um, by reducing avoidable contact. It also massively increases the customer experience. So we heard about the Olympics yesterday. Um, we were one of the sponsors, so Atos provided the overall SIAM layer for the Olympics. Um, massive infrastructure, 20 odd thousand, um, 27,000 I think journalists were all coming in doing BYOD, plugging into the network, we knew it was gonna get attacked. So we had, during the period of the Olympics and Paralympic Games, 686 serious security incidents um, through that. 
And one of our legacies is to create our IL3 services available by G Cloud, um, which basically allow you to, through the PSN connection, have an IL3 accredited data center, um, but you can buy that on a commodity basis. Rather, an impressive slide for a 20 million pound investment. Um, today has over a thousand servers running, a number of big government departments, um, available on G Cloud starting at 394 pounds for a platform as a service. The only one infrastructure as a service were about 135 pounds a month. I've heard a lot about authentication. Um, there's an organization we've done, the work with a number of companies around authentication. This is an interesting case study. Um, so SWIFT, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Transfer, Financial Telecommunications. Um, they operate the network that keeps the global financial system working. Um, behind that is a small company, or a smallish company, um, called SafeNet. We provide the uh, secure hardware security modules and remote access solution to the management of that network. Um, I think Johan was talking earlier from very sec about the, um, the business case for two-factor authentication. Um, the most expensive we've seen is £200 per user per year. Um, we offer it at £2 per user per month, so £24 a year. You sign up a two-year two contract is one pound thirty per user per month. Um, minimum order is two hundred, so I've put it on here. All of these prices are based on a one-year contract. At the end of the one-year contract, if you don't like these services, you can move off them. So four products that hopefully have got you excited, but my job isn't to sell you those four products. My job is to sell you that on cloud, through G Cloud, there are some incredible products that are available to you. Um, in terms of speed, I promised uh, faster earlier on. Uh, the fastest time from first inquiry to contract for us is 13 days. Um, so 13 days to run a procurement. I was speaking to one government department and I told them that and they went, wow, that's slow. Our fastest is 72 hours to run a procurement. And that's our, fast, that's our freest, our cheapest, uh, product, um, which is based on the principle of a multi-sided market. Fuel Genie provides fuel cards. Um, one of the benefits is you get a 45 days free credit, whether that's important in the public sector, I'm unclear. Um, but it does simplify administration hugely. So you get one bill for all of your fuel, takes away the need for employees to fill out expense claims for, for petrol, etc. The expired on the card, it's all batched up, HMRC approved one bill uh, every month for all of the fuel. Um, as I say, it typically drives about 4% fuel savings. Um, so that's it. I was looking at the back. Um, do we know, I asked a question earlier as to whether we had to finish at 12.15, 12.20? Not sure. I'm sure someone will come on and kick us out. Um, so yeah, so very final point then. I'm going to go through this. Um, sort of. Usually in the presentation you want to leave people on a high. Um, this might not achieve that. But one of the things that we need to understand, um, so our job as suppliers is to support our clients achieving their mission. So we need to understand the environment and landscape within which our clients are operating so that we can provide appropriate products and services. So I thought it would be interesting just to quickly reflect on the public sector spread um, and where that's going and where it's gone. Um, so a little bit about where the money goes. Um, social protection, 220 billion, so that's welfare and pensions. Uh, health, 137. Education, 97. And fourth in the list at the minute, debt interest at 51. There's a bit about where the money comes from, which I think is quite interesting. I won't dwell on that. Um, so, pre the announcements last week, we were heading towards a situation where we had, we had debt at 1.7 trillion um, by 2020. The good news is that's gone down because the economy is recovering, etc., etc. But we're still going to be in debt to the level of 1.6 trillion by the time that the deficit is reduced by 2018-19. Whether that actually is achieved is an interesting one because what the Chancellor did was say, well, we're not going to be blamed for things that happen after the election. So a lot of the uh, tax increases, etc., and some of the schemes uh, that were announced to support young people, etc., terminate at the election so that they're not built into the, the future borrowing uh, of the country. So by the time we get to 2018, 
our debt interest will be 76 billion. And if we pay back the 1.6 trillion at 50 billion a year, that'll take us over 30 years. So we've got there 126 billion pounds a year, um, which is probably by that stage more than health. Um, so it is likely if we split out welfare and pension costs that by 2018, 2019, 2020, our highest level of spend uh, in the public sector is going to be on debt, interest and debt repayments. So I guess the upshot from that is really where is austerity going? Is austerity here to stay? Is it going to get better? Or potentially are things going to get tighter? And are the decisions that we take around where we need to go in the future are going to get harder? Um, on that cheery note, <laughs> thank you. I hope that was helpful. Um, I hope the examples were helpful. There are really good quality services out there, not just from ASOS, from many other, uh, other organizations, um, and they're available on a very fast framework, which uh, the wider public sector, uh, any public sector organization can use. Um, before we finish, any, any questions? <coughs> yeah, those financial predictions usually stop the audience into silence. It's like, oh my god, right, we'll have to go away and work on that one. Um, great. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.